Um, I'm Catherine Farman. Uh, thank you for joining me in the twice as large room. So now I'm twice as terrified to stand up here in front of you. I am going to talk about responsive jQuery. I'm standing further back. Is this cool? You guys can still hear me, right? Okay. So I work for a company called Happy Cog. You may have heard of it. Um, we are notable for being founded by godfather of web standards, Jeffrey Zeldman. Um, if you made websites in the 90s, you may have encountered him at one point. Um, we do stuff like a list apart and cognition where we share what we work on and um, also publish guides to web design with a book apart. So we are a web design company. Um, we're based in Philadelphia, New York City, and Austin. And because we are uh, mainly a design company, um, we do all kinds of client work. Uh, presently, we seem to be doing more and more responsive design. Pretty much every project I've worked on since starting at Happy Cog last summer has been a responsive website. And typically, we'll, we'll always do the design for a project, and we'll do front-end templates, and we may or may not also do the back-end integration. So about half of our projects will do the CMS as well as the front-end templates. Um, if you're not familiar with responsive design, it's simply the principles of making websites work on all kinds of screen sizes. So when iPhones and mobile devices became popular, this became really important. Um, if you could serve one website to every computer, then it makes our jobs that much easier and people get a better experience too. Um, typically, the focus on responsive design has been CSS. Media queries enable us to serve customized layouts to different screen sizes, and we can do a lot of work with responsive design just through CSS. But what I'm finding in my work at Happy Cog is that a lot of designs really require tailoring your behaviors um, with JavaScript to different screen sizes. One example of that is the new Guardian website. This isn't a Happy Cog project, but if you go to theguardian.com, you'll see they have a link in their header for the beta experience of their uh, new responsive redesign. And they have this different behavior for their navigation. If you go to the site on small screens, you get this toggle drop down. We've all seen that before. You've got like the hamburger icon, and then you get a list of links you can go to. But on large screens, the content changes completely. Um, because they have the screen real estate to list those links in the header, they just swap out that kind of content in the, in the drop down. Um, so this kind of behavior change is um, something that I'm doing pretty much in all my projects at Happy Cog, and I'm starting to put together uh, patterns that can be reused across new projects as well. So for my purposes today, I am stealing a definition of a pattern from the book JavaScript Patterns. Um, which says that a pattern is not necessarily a code solution that's ready for copy and paste. It's more of a best practice or a useful abstraction, and it's a template for solving categories of problems. So I'm going to follow that kind of definition of patterns. Um, the code patterns in this talk are really basic, and they're meant to be applied in a wide variety of contexts. And they can also be customized to be made more complex, just based on whatever your project needs. I'm also going to show some user interface patterns. And this kind of idea of sharing responsive patterns um, came to me from Brad Frost. He has this really great website where he lists out different UI patterns. And you can click on them and see the code. Um, and I, I started developing kind of my own code pens and my own little code snippets based on this, this principle um, so that we could reuse them in projects at Happy Cog. So we're going to be talking about both code patterns and UI patterns that follow those coding patterns. The kind of overarching code patterns I'm going to share are of three types. We've got basic conditionals, we've got resize patterns, and we've got consistent patterns, consistent behavior, that's what I'm calling it, and those are my favorites. So the first is the basic conditional. So this is pretty straightforward, right? Everyone knows it's probably one of the first things you learn if you're programming is how to do if and else statements no matter what language. Um, and this is becoming really useful for responsive design because it's essentially mimicking what CSS does with media queries, which is conditional styles. Um, so your basic pattern will look something like this. And even though it's really simple, I'm trying to um, come up with best practices when we're using this in projects. So um, this particular pattern uh, has a function that you run on click. 
and the function is, uh, has a conditional inside it to check the screen size, the screen viewport width, and depending on what the screen size is, it's going to do two things. It's either going to do something for small screens or something for large screens. So this pattern is something that's come up over and over again um, when working uh, on responsive projects for clients. Um, a lot of little best practices can be found in this pattern that just make it easier to use it over and over again and to share it with other developers. Um, basically, using the on method uh, just to make sure um, that you're being consistent in uh, how you're firing events. And we also want to check the screen size inside of our function. So this is something um, that's super nifty because you may have a different screen size on page load than whatever the viewport is when your event actually fires. So you want to make sure that whatever you're trying to hook into, um, you're checking screen size at the time of that event occurring. Um, and then one thing that I've started doing that I got out of using SAS actually is defining variables for all my breakpoints. Um, if you've ever used SAS or preprocessor, it's really easy to just save common breakpoints that you would use in your media queries. And you can give them a name like small or large, or I even use like iPad or portrait sometimes, depending on what kind of device or size you're targeting. And I now started copying these over to JavaScript so that they're available to me in my code, they're consistent with the styles that we're making for the site, and you can reuse them in multiple places in your JavaScript. Now, um, one thing that I found that's really fraught with just this basic pattern is checking the window size. Believe it or not, getting the viewport size in JavaScript is a clusterfuck. It sounds really simple, and I thought it was, but it's not. Um, so there's problems with all of these methods right here, and I've used all of them. So the first is pretty basic. You use jQuery, you get the window width using the width method. The problem with that is that different browsers will return a different value if you use the width method. So some browsers subtract the scroll bar from the width, um, so you may not get consistent values across browsers. So I turn to the second one, which is inner width. Inner width will return consistent values whether there's a scroll bar on the page or not. Um, the problem is it only works in modern browsers. So then I turn to this last check, which is using different properties for different browsers, and it returns consistent values cross-browser. Now, the problem with all of these uh, techniques is none of them will consistently match your CSS breakpoints which sucks. Your CSS may be trying to do something in concert with your JavaScript a lot of times, and when they don't happen at the same point on the page, your stuff breaks. Um, this to me is why web standards are super important. If browsers could do all of these things the same way, we'd be golden and we wouldn't have to worry about getting the window size. But um, because they don't, we have to come up with some workarounds. Um, and if you're having trouble picturing like what, how this doesn't work, I recommend this website. It's called What Size Is Your Viewport With? And if you go to it, it will tell you the values um, reported by JavaScript using different methods to uh, get the width of your browser window. Um, it also illustrates how, again, these don't necessarily match what CSS uh, is reporting as your window width. When we got to this point at Happy Cog, um, we decided we're going to have to find a new solution. So luckily, there is a native JavaScript API called Match Media, which seems to be the solution to all of our problems. You can match CSS media queries exactly with this API. You use the same syntax. So in CSS, when you say do something at min width 800 pixels and max width, 1,200 pixels, you can use that same min width, max width parameter for your JavaScript, and it should work. And it will work consistently because browsers, um, it will detect the browser CSS viewport. Now, uh, you also have add listener method with uh, match media, which is super helpful if the screen size changes and your media query changes at any point and you want to check it again. The problem with this is IE9 and below do not support it. Um, it's a newer API, so modern browsers only. But there are a couple of polyfills if you want to go this route. Um, 
one thing to keep in mind, the more popular polyfill does not support the add listener method. So if you need that support in older browsers, you want to check um, for events um, for these screen size media queries uh, changing, then you're going to need to use the other polyfill that does support ad listener. Um, so this is the route that we're going with Happy Kai. We're starting to convert our projects to use match media. And we're also looking at inquire.js, which is kind of a wrapper for match media. It uses match media um, for a lot of its functionality. And it also requires the polyfill if you're going to use it. But it has some extra features, and it's got a really clean syntax. There are some other um, less kind of learning curve, feature intensive uh, hacks for getting CSS breakpoints into JavaScript. Um, but they really are kind of hacks. Um, you're kind of trying to like add pseudo elements to the page and detect the uh, media query, the style that's been applied to them. And using that, you can kind of infer that like this is the current screen size. Um, so if you're interested in doing like some quick and dirty shortcuts to getting the CSS breakpoints into JavaScript, I recommend looking up these methods. Um, but if you're doing like a client project or a production project, you probably want to move forward with something better um, suited for the task like match media. So getting back to, despite all that, getting back to our simple conditional pattern, um, I'm going to move forward with showing you some kind of basic non-match media examples uh, that are good for getting started with responsive patterns. So this is something I call the accordion box. It's kind of a hybrid accordion um, light box widget that I made for an e-commerce project. Um, this came about because I hate dialogues and light boxes, and I think they suck. I think they suck at all screen sizes, not just small screens, but they really, really suck on like an iPhone. If you've ever gotten a dialogue in an iPhone, it's like the surest way to like leave a website fast is to throw up a dialogue on someone's mobile device. Um, but the way that I got around this was for an e-commerce site, we wanted to throw up a, a pop-up that had shipping information. Um, on large screens, the, this made a lot of sense, but small screens less so. So we changed the behavior for small screens so that it was a drop-down accordion, whatever you want to call it. It's this example is just a simple slide toggle. So on small screens, you click the button, slides open, you get a tiny kitten. Large screens, throws up a giant kitten in an overlay. And the JavaScript for this is really simple. Um, it's exactly the same pattern as the basic conditional I showed before. And you're just throwing different functions inside the conditional. Another really great use case for using this conditional pattern is lazy load. So on a project we've been working on at Happy Cog, um, we have an ambient video that's kind of like this beautiful video, and it really adds a lot of uh, narrative to the page and messaging. But it's huge. It's like one megabyte. And nobody needs to be downloading that when they get to the page right immediately. Um, so we made it load when you scroll to that section of the site. And the other thing we did is we put this inside of a conditional um, based on the screen size so that mobile devices wouldn't be loading this video either. The next pattern I'm going to talk about is the resize pattern. So this is an important pattern. Um, if you want, if you're not using match media yet, you'll need to use window resize. And I use the jQuery method for this to keep your uh, JS working across the screen sizes. So if you run your code correctly on page load, um, it's fine and dandy. But if you're not doing something when the page size changes to make sure that things are consistent, your code can break, right? Or your UI can break, or things can start to look wonky. Um, some examples of that. This is a website we built for a restaurant. And we have this little newsletter dialogue in the footer. When you uh, first click it in a large screen context, it makes a lot of sense. There's like a little button for you to open and close it. But if you resize the window and the footer styles change, you lose that context. And it's kind of this orphan pop-up that's just kind of hovering down there. There's no real like sense of where it came from or what to do with it now. And there's no way to close it. So this is a prime candidate for adding some kind of resize that uh, does some different behavior for this pop-up dialog. Another scenario is that lazy load video I described. When you load that video at a large screen size and resize, 
If you don't have something on resize to check if it's already loaded, um, you'll end up having, we had a place, we had like a simple image from when the video didn't load as like a placeholder. So in this case, you resized and then you still have the image and you have the video on top of it. So we didn't want both of these showing at the same time, so we had to write something that checked if it was loaded on resize and if so, hide the image or remove it from the DOM. And the resize pattern that I typically use looks like this. You're going to have a function. In this case, this example is a conditional again. And you're going to run it on document ready. And then you're also going to do it on resize. So on the window resize event, I'm going to do the same function. I'm going to toggle a button. Please don't use this ever to toggle a button. <laughs> if you want to show and hide a button, you should use CSS for that. But this is like the most basic example I could come up with for this pattern. And you'll note that I'm using um, throttle to uh, improve performance on this. So um, throttle and debounce I find pretty necessary. Uh, browsers, when you're running a resize event, they will typically do your function the entire time that you're resizing the browser. So it could fire like hundreds of times. And you don't want your function running that many times. So if you use throttle or debounce, and I use Ben Almond's plugin for this, um, you can improve performance because you will keep the number of times that your function's running minimal. Um, with throttle, you are going to be firing your event like every few seconds or ever, however long you want. And then with debounce, it's going to fire once after resize. Um, some other tips for resize patterns that you can add to, um, you can add and extend it with, uh, are using initial window size as like a check kind of against when the window size changes later. Um, we used this at Happy Cog. We were working on a slideshow that had various options that we changed when you got to like a small screen size. Now, um, when we were writing the plugin for this, we didn't want to destroy and reinitialize the slideshow every time someone resized the page window if we didn't need to, right? So what if you started a large screen and you went slightly smaller? You don't need to reload that slideshow all over again when that scenario happens. So we had a check at the beginning of page load and um, when the re resize event happened uh, to make sure that there was a significant enough change to like a new breakpoint that then we would reinitialize the slideshow. Some other uses for the resize pattern are when you're using external jQuery plugins. Uh, a lot of times, I'll use plugins that have already been built, right? You can go to like jQuery UI. Um, the Equal Heights plugin is something I've used on a lot of sites. It's like when you have like a, an e-commerce page is a good example. You have a list of products in a grid, and you want them to all be the same height. Um, Equal Heights plugin will find the tallest one and make them all match it. It's pretty nifty. Now, if you're using CSS to change the size of things on with media queries, that can break the initial so, uh, height that was added by Equal Heights. So if you put that inside of a resize event, you can make sure that you're running it again when the page layout changes, and it won't break your page. Um, so these are all kind of use cases when you would want to keep resize in mind. And the last pattern is my favorite. It is consistent behavior. Um, I wanted to mention this and emphasize it just because, to me, this is the ideal pattern if you're building a responsive site. Um, I think the fact that we can change behavior based on screen size doesn't mean we necessarily always should. We should always keep in mind the experience of the user on the website. What's the best design solution? Do we need to come up with new design solutions, or do we need to just um, fall back to, like, already made patterns. I think the tendency is to fall back to already made patterns where we know that we can change the JavaScript behavior for a small screen. So we're not going to think through exactly how to change our navigation architecture or whatever design element um, to make it consistent and functional at all screen sizes. So I would encourage you um, to push back when you have significant JavaScript behaviors between breakpoints in a responsive design. If you're not the designer, uh, you should still speak up, and, and I think it's a good uh, practice to keep things consistent across screen sizes and devices. It's really also um, a matter of progressive enhancement. If we can keep 
all of our important styling and behavioral information even as much as possible in the CSS, it's only going to make for a better website. Um, I mean, we, people talk about how everyone has JavaScript enabled, but I'm a firm believer that no matter how much JavaScript you're writing, your site still needs to function without it. If you're building a website like I am and not an application, I need that website and its content to be available to users if something goes wrong and JavaScript doesn't load. So I try to put as much uh, animation and design into CSS now as is possible. Um, when I'm building a jQuery pattern for this, something usually there's like a, a trigger and some kind of animation takes place. I try to always move the animation into the CSS. And this is really easy now because we have animation transitions, we have modernizers, so we can do feature detection, and we can see if a browser can actually handle this transition, then we'll apply it. And if not, we can always come up with some kind of fallback. Um, I think a really good illustration of this consistent behavior method is this scroll shuttle JavaScript or jQuery plugin. This was written by my colleague Anthony Colangelo. He was, he was nominated for like Young Developer of the Year in the .NET Awards for two years in a row. He's like this uh, really young uh, prodigy developer guy. So I highly recommend his jQuery plugins, but I really like this one because it uses CSS to do typical JavaScript behavior stuff. So um, it works really well across all screen sizes because of that. And the, my favorite thing about it is it doesn't have any kind of like touch events or touch JavaScript. It's all touch friendly UI made with simple CSS styles. And he uses um, transitions in it to animate advancing and going through the slideshow. So this is the slideshow in action. Super simple. You can see it's small screens. It's just like touch navigable and then or scroll navigable as well. And then at large screens, you get the next and the previous buttons that you can um, show with CSS. And then when uh, you're using the plugin, you can uh, set up those buttons to, to advance the slideshow. Another example of this kind of consistent behavior that I'm really favoring, um, especially if you have like a simple navigation and you don't have tons and tons of nested levels, is it seems really obvious, but I just want to share it because I enjoy using it and trying to use it in maximum amount of situations as possible. Um, it's basically a small screen, it's a drop down, and you uh, have a menu button and you open the menu, right? We've all seen this pattern in use. And then on large screens, you have CSS, hide the trigger button, the, the button for the menu, and you make the nav visible. So all of the items in the navigation will be uh, visible for large screens. It's a simple pattern, but it's super powerful, and it doesn't require the resize patterns. It doesn't even require any conditionals. It's the minimum amount of JavaScript or jQuery that you need to get it done. All it does is toggle open and close for small screens, and then CSS handles the rest. And then the last pattern I want to share is kind of an enhancement of that previous one. Um, and that's using CSS, again, to do the heavy lifting. So now we're really lucky. We have CSS animations and transitions with CSS3. Um, so I'm trying to use those as much as possible. So we can use jQuery to fire events and use that um, to add our behavior to the page. But all we have to do now is simply add classes to our content and style those classes differently to get animation behaviors on the page, which is really cool. Um, with CSS, you can animate the height and the width of elements, and we used to have to only use jQuery for that or, or JavaScript. And um, you can always add a fallback. So one thing I like to do is check if a CSS transition is available in the browser, and if it's not, then we add a jQuery animate fallback. Super simple, super fast, and effective, um, easy to implement pattern. So this is that in practice on a Happy Cog project right now that I'm working on. We've got a small screen drop down where it just comes down and the height animates. And then it's uh, sticky navigation. It's still sticky. Um, it still opens and closes at large screens, but it comes out left to right. So we animate the width instead of the height. And that's all just CSS changing. So it's super simple um, and powerful and then easy to make fallbacks for. All right, so that's 
all my patterns. I have a few of these on CodePen. If you'd like to peruse them or send feedback to me, please feel free to. That's the URL for the CodePen collection, and I'm on Twitter. Thank you.